On October 29th, when Hurricane Sandy hit the continent, it was about a thousand kilometers wide. Its windy reach killed two people in Canada, while tens of thousands lost power north of the border, mostly in Quebec and the Maritimes. This paled in comparison to the devastation in the areas sitting directly in Sandy's path, mainly the coastal states of New Jersey and New York. Of the 131 Americans killed, 90 of them perished here. In the early evening hours of October 29th, Hurricane Sandy, also known as the Superstorm, first came ashore in the United States. This is at the very north end of Atlantic City. The streets here are covered. We knew this with the title flooding. It is only expected to get worse as Sandy makes her landfall here in New Jersey. $70 billion in total damage is a difficult number for most of us to fathom. Think of the destruction on a more personal level. One car, one business, one house at a time, washed away. The next morning we had on our, on our electronic boards, nice try Sandy. So, you know, it's kind of the attitude we've taken since then. The Atlantic City's open for business and okay after the hurricane. Just less than a month later, the power had been restored. The cleanup and restoration was well underway, and Atlantic City braced for something completely different, a thrilling night of hockey. We drove up on the bus, and we expected to see sand everywhere and everything. And they got to get the word out. Atlantic City is alive. Atlantic City is up, and it's, it looks great. And we walked out on a boardwalk. We walked out of Caesars and walked down to Boardwalk Hall, and it looks great. Welcome to Operation Hat Trick, with three charities in mind. The American Red Cross, New York's Empire State Relief Fund, and the New Jersey Hurricane Relief Fund. Guys, we're very, uh, very happy to have here in Atlantic City where it was affected. We also have people from Rockaways and Staten Island here. And, uh, yeah. Big pen. thanks to all you guys and the players for making this happen. Have fun. With the goal of raising at least a half million dollars for storm victims, three dozen NHLers split up onto Team Brad Richards, with a bit of a New York tilt, and Team Scott Hartnell, representing more of Philadelphia and South Jersey. Cesar's casino has been unbelievable getting guys in here. Uh, thank you to all the players for coming out. But uh, most of all, thank you to everyone here and, and our hearts and prayers and thoughts are going out for everyone that's uh, been affected by this storm. The game was thrown together in about a week with the help of volunteers, Caesars Entertainment, who fed workers and housed players, and former flyer Todd Fedorik, who developed in that organization and now coaches in the state of New Jersey with Trenton of the ECHL. You know, there's so many teams in such a small area, you know, in this tri-state area that uh, they're all kind of connected to the communities and their communities were affected in some way. So when your like, neighbor is underwater, you're like, yeah, I'm going to play a game, maybe I'll get you some help. It, it, it's a pretty easy sell. And, you know, once, it, once the ball got rolling, more and more guys joined on, and then it became something where, you know, it had legitimacy in, in the caliber of players, and, and more and more guys come on. And then you can really make a, a good event, and a special event for the players to see, because some, some of the skill can, that's going to be showcased in, in the game is, yeah, well, it's the best in the league, so that's, that's special. The timing was fortuitous. The ice was already down at the Boardwalk Hall for an upcoming series of American Hockey League games. Area NHL players were already attempting to organize a game or two simply for the purpose of getting some competitive training. When the storm recovery effort was tossed in the mix, the event became a reality, bringing players from as far away as Sweden and a dozen or so who were back home in Canada. Well, obviously when, when people reach out to you and, and ask you to come, come be involved in something like this, obviously you know, your first reaction is going to be, be instant yes. And, um, you know, to come down here to be a part of this, to help and, and raise some funds for a good cause, it, uh, to help some people, I think that's why everybody's here. For one night in Atlantic City, New Jersey, it was all about NHLers playing hockey. With this season's All-Star Game already canceled due to the ongoing owner's lockout, Operation Hat Trick served as a fitting substitute. No hits, no block shots, very little deep. Henrik Lundqvist of the Rangers gave up six goals, but he also made 57 saves. 
as Brad Richards team jumped out to a 4-0 first period lead and won the game 10-6 with future Hall of Famer Marty Brodeur of the Devils manning the crease at the other end. Richards had three assists for the winners, Matt Martin added two, while the big offensive star was James Neal of the Penguins who finished with four goals. It was a breakaway festival. Tickets for Operation Hat Trick went for between $20 and $100, and all of the jerseys and some of the equipment used by the players is still being auctioned off. The Boardwalk Hall is a classic venue. After being constructed almost a hundred years ago, it was described as the eighth wonder of the world, with then the planet's largest enclosed open building space and ceiling. It's the former longtime home of the Miss America pageant, the home to the Eastern Hockey League's Seagulls back in the 1930s and 40s, and to the ECHL champion Boardwalk Bullies earlier this century. Coincidentally, in 1933, the then largest crowd ever to watch a hockey game in history, 22,157, attended a Red Cross fundraiser between the Gulls and the New York Rangers. The Operation Hat Trick crowd reached the maximum current seating capacity of 10,792. That was special. Yeah, that was special, you know, especially because, you, you know, you look into the crowd, there was a mix of everybody out there tonight. I think you saw some Philly fans, uh, some Rangers fans. I, I think I saw some Jersey uh, Devils fans. You had the uh, Islanders fans, you, they, you know, all over. I saw some people with uh, Carcillo Phoenix jersey, you know, so uh, I think you got a, a really uh, uh, great mix of people, and uh, I think hopefully everyone had fun tonight. We're touched, you know, we come in and, and look like heroes here, but there's a lot of heroes behind the, behind the scenes and, and uh, you look at the devastation from Hurricane Sandy, it's uh, uh, a lot of heroes, a lot of uh, um, stories of the devastation and people coming together, communities coming together and it just uh, uh, makes your heart melt. When we come back to Operation Hat Trick, Canadian hockey players doing what comes naturally. The effects of Hurricane Sandy on the Jersey Shore are omnipresent. Day-to-day -day business is back to normal for the most part. For example, Atlantic City and the casinos are open for business, but the scrapes and bruises will remain for a while. A limited number of residents in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut remained without power into late November. It's taken us about a month. We have about uh, half of our house has heat. Um, we just got our washer and dryer yesterday so we can do our laundry here rather than taking it on the road. And uh, the neighborhood's coming around. Everybody's working, everybody's building up, everybody's putting in new floors. And, um, a lot of appliances are coming in here. New refrigerators, new washers, new dryers. Aside from damage estimates, it's believed the overall economy in that tri-state area suffered about $25 billion in lost business activity. Anytime that there's, uh, you know, something as devastating that would happen on, on the East Coast and in certain areas, uh, uh, things like this kind of take a life of their own and uh, that's basically what happened with this. It, it, it grew and grew and grew and, uh, you know, more guys, you know, jumped aboard and, and really, you know, I think that's attest to what the type of athlete that the hockey players are. Former Tampa Bay Stanley Cup champion, Conn Smythe Trophy winner, and current New York Ranger Brad Richards is what we like to think of as the consummate Canadian hockey player. Humble, hardworking, generous to his community. A native of the fishing village of Murray Harbor, Prince Edward Island, Richards is now an inhabitant of a much larger coastal entity, New York City, and has taken his new surroundings to heart. His post-Sandy relief efforts have been quietly well documented. Red went down to the Rockaways and we were cleaning out some houses. He just came down and we were ripping out the walls and um, trying to help some people out. And when this, he also did a uh, skating clinic in Staten Island. 
which we raised about $15,000. He skated with some kids. A lot of the guys, 11 Rangers came down, and uh, it was a great, great event. And then when this was coming up, he says, Steve, I think it'd be a good idea if we get some people who were affected by the hurricane to come down and get to the game and, you know, get out of the house for a little bit, get away for the night. And I said, it's a great idea. We'll put it together. And we got we had one bus that came from Staten Island and one bus that came from Far Rockaway, all with families that were affected by the, by the hurricane one way or another, you know, out of their house, lost their house or lost cars and whatever it may be. So we got about a, almost 100 people here. Brad Richards especially, um, he's been known amongst the boys that he, he's one of those guys that's just, uh, you know, a heart of gold. And, and he does a lot in the communities that he's a part of. Yeah, a lot like most hockey players, they're all kind of uh, giving to where they live because they really become part of their communities. It's one of the, it's one of the things that um, you know we're taught as as athletes coming up is that you you play in the communities and you, and you give back to the communities because you have a gift to obviously entertain. Those guys actually went down there to to, to try and help with the cleanup. Brad Richards and his crew and. Um, what they decided to do and they wanted to do as a part of this is bring 150 of those misplaced families, first responders, to this event and really, you know, hit a home run in, in saying this is what it's about. It's about helping these families and it's about giving to these families and these people affected by what happened. As Fedorik mentioned, giving back is a common trait, and if one ever wondered whether hockey teams and firehouses share a common mentality, here's the answer. Men who watch one another's back, take care of each other, spend large blocks of time together. The camaraderie is similar. Players who paid a visit to the first responders, the police and firemen in Atlantic City, were just as thrilled with the visit as were the resident hockey fans. I've never been so close to them, so it's uh, really cool to meet them. The guys are down to earth, um, taking their time out to come see us is, is great. On October 29th, Jenkins and his cohorts were wading through two feet of water at the firehouse. Less than four weeks later, they found themselves greatly anticipating a hockey game. I think it's awesome. Uh, I'm a season ticket holder for the Flyers, so I love hockey. Um, but none of them really live around here, so they're coming out of their way, out of the country. Um, you know, and from being with their family and coming here to see us and put on a charity event, I think it's awesome. The water is now rushing in from the ocean. It is all the way back in the streets. At the end of October, the streets in AC had turned into canals, and nearby homes were destroyed or underwater to the second floor. By the end of November, any major positive distraction, especially a performance by world-class athletes, was a welcome sight. I think anytime you can help people, um, when people are in tough times and things are, 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 are tough, I think for us right now, uh, we're getting an opportunity to do something in a community or in, a, in an area. Um, from teammates and stuff and, and friends, I've, I've had friends lose boats, uh, cars, a lot of things that gone on. So. When I got the phone call, it was, a, it was a yes right away because of we believe we're all here to do something special and, and we're excited about it. The player closest to his original home, who had friends and family most affected, was Toronto Maple Leaf James Van Riemsdyk. The Middletown, New Jersey native was drafted by and played three seasons with the Flyers, a team located just 70 miles to the west. Being a Jersey Shore native, uh, a lot of this hits really close to home. I know I had a lot of uh, friends and family that were really affected by uh, Hurricane Sandy and uh, after Hurricane Sandy I wanted to be involved with something and then I got the call that this game was going on and it couldn't be a, a better cause to support so I was really happy to come down. After the game, Flyers defenseman Braden Coburn, a native of Calgary, referred to men and women like Fireman Jenkins as the people with their boots on the ground and couldn't admire them enough. The support that the fans uh, showed us meant a lot but uh, you know personally, personally I, you know I would like to thank you know, all the people that uh, were really uh, the first guys on the scene and helping everybody out, that's the firefighters and the volunteers and the policemen and, and all those guys that, uh, that are helping out all the families. I think they, uh, they deserve, uh, you know, a lot of attention. And, and uh, I think, you know, this whole thing, that's what it was about, is trying to bring attention to those people and, and raise money for uh, a good cause and, and rebuilding, uh, you know, what was left uh, from, a, from a terrible tragedy. Event organizer Fedorik, who played more than 500 games in the National Hockey League, is a native of Redwater, Alberta. We play a, an honest game and a, and a kind of a simple game and, and you know, 
we're we're good people, and and that it just shows by, you know, their their availability to do things like this. A sense of Canadiana, a slice of ideology from the Great White North, alive and well in South Jersey. When Operation Hat Trick continues, the elephant in the room. If anyone deserved to see the rare hockey game that was Operation Hat Trick, it was the people in southern New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. Without the NHL, and therefore the Flyers to the west and the Devils and Rangers well to the north, the hockey options for local residents are scarce. The former occupants of the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, the Boardwalk Bullies of the ECHL, left town almost a decade ago, a year after winning a Kelly Cup title in 2003. The Philadelphia Phantoms, the American League Farm Club for the Flyers, and a team that shared the big club's practice rink, last year moved to Adirondack in upstate New York. The closest professional team now would be the Reading Royals of the ECHL, which is double-A hockey, about 200 kilometers to the west of AC in Pennsylvania. There is no such thing as major juniors in the region, and aside from the occasional American League special event visit, it's 260K to the closest AHL team in Hershey. <laughs> Under normal circumstances, without a work stoppage, the NHL endlessly promotes its players and all of their charitable efforts. It's good for business. In lockout mode, however, no promotion, not a mention of this game on NHL.com, and no live television coverage. The business here was charity, but promoting the players in this case meant potentially impacting the CBA public relations battle, an unfortunate dynamic the participants opted to ignore. Charity was the focus, while the lockout was the elephant in the room. And obviously we're disappointed and frustrated about what's going on with the CBA, but I think all of us here today um, and are participating this weekend are, are very excited about the opportunity to help out a great cause. And to be honest, that's what we're, our main focus is right now, and um, we're going to have a great time doing it. And to be honest, I think we're all excited to get on the ice with each other again right now and, and have some competitive fun. So um, I think that's where everyone's at right now. The flip side? Without the work stoppage, there would have been no Operation Hat Trick. No unique event for hockey fans who normally wouldn't get a chance to see this all-star collection of sorts, and for fans who don't trek or can't afford to trek regularly to Philadelphia for the NHL. Caesars Entertainment, who handled ticket sales and operations for the event without compensation, had to wait until nearly the last minute to give the final go-ahead. If the hockey talks continued to stall, we knew we had a window. We had probably eight days and. We have an unbelievable group of people that just looked at each other, and I think I think every detail is ironed out. We got, you know, tickets on sale. The one mistake I made, I think, was not pricing the tickets higher. But it's always after the fact; you can always uh, second guess yourself. But uh, but it came together really well, and it's exciting. And we got unbelievable um, NHL talent here. Unions get a bad rap from a portion of the population, and politics often run deep in those organizations. In this case, politics were thrown out the window. Everyone, union or not, electricians, cleaning people, cameramen, tickets, off-ice officials, on-ice officials, etc., all worked for free. Meanwhile, the players flew in from overseas and from all over North America. A lot of people wouldn't expect a player from Montreal Canadiens and a Toronto native to show up at an event like this, but... Um, to be honest with you, we're all in this together, and I think that it speaks volumes, um, you know, especially with what the players are going through right now, um, to show up here and, and, and really appreciate the people, the real heroes, and, you know, the police officers, the firefighters. I mean, these are the people. These are the, the heroes, you know, and, uh, you know, for us to come out here and show our support and, you know, for the fans, I think it's great. It's great for the city. The NHLers had the opportunity to reestablish some hockey camaraderie with friends and foes known and unknown. Fierce Atlantic Division rivalries were set aside. We leave that on the ice, you know, you, you, you play hard during the season and uh, I'm sure there's some Ranger players or fans that aren't too fond of me, but uh, <laughs> we, we come here to be together. This is a, a bigger cause than, uh, than anything. And in the summer, you know what, half of us are buddies and uh, hockey's a sport where uh, we've all either trained together along the way or have met up, but uh, 
you know, this is, everyone is here together for the cause and it's, it's going to be a lot of fun to get some guys like PK said, I haven't met that are going to be here. So um, have only played against. So at the end of the day, it, it's going to be nice to get to meet different players in the league and, and get to go on the ice with them. The charitable element and the big event factor was a bonus for the players who otherwise would have been playing amongst themselves somewhere else, likely in an empty or near empty building. It's fun for us to do this stuff, and uh, we love doing it. This, this was a great feeling today to get back out and, and see the fans and for the cause that we know how important it is for the people in this area. One longtime area hockey fan whose working relationship in broadcast production and otherwise dates back to the Broad Street bullies of the 1970s is John Glassy. During Hurricane Sandy, the bay he lives next to ended up in his house. He's still rebuilding. Well, I was happy that it was still here because I had to walk past about eight blocks of homes that I knew were going to be condemned, and there was a distinct smell of gasoline from all the boats and the docks that were in the middle of the street. But uh, it was uh, it was the worst I've seen it, and I've lived here 36 years in this house, and I've lived in this area over 60 years, so it was a pretty strong storm. <laughs> As a diehard hockey man who still plays in a weekly pickup game at his local rink, Glassy would like to see the NHL and NHLPA's relationship rebuilt. He believes fans here miss the entertainment, the distraction, the pastime of following the sport, particularly in these difficult times, as much as anyone, anywhere. It was kind of nice that, uh, that New York's region and the Philadelphia region, South Jersey region all got together and supported this game at the at the boardwalk hall it was a phenomenal game a lot of fun um, showed a lot of people that uh, lang city was still open and it showed that uh, we're all in this together because the jersey shore from here to new york was uh, devastated by this storm and so hockey was great and hockey was a diversion for one night and they raised a lot of money and uh, showed a lot of people that uh, we're still open for business and that people care well let's hear from the players fans and supporters of operation hattrick Will hockey recover from its man-made economic devastation? That question presently goes unanswered. But for now, those in the path of Sandy are doing much, much better, thanks in part to some genuine hockey people. At this moment, the exact total raised from this event is unknown. But given the ticket sales and the online game-used equipment auction at Steiner Sports, it's a safe bet the effort will eclipse a half million dollars, likely with room to spare. Consider that three days after the game, the winning bid for a Henrik Lundqvist goalie mask in a similar Sandy auction was $66,000. From those who weathered the storm, thank you to all involved for Operation Hat Trick. <laughs> <laughs>